Last time we were working in section 2.3, we were talking about transformations. Um, we didn't get to the part about symmetry. We will today. Um, we had talked about three different types of transformations. One of them was called a translation. Translations shift things up and down, left and right. Um, and then we talked about reflections. Those flip graphs over the x or the y axis. And we talked about stretches, and we specifically did vertical stretches, and they make things either taller and skinnier or short and fatter. Um, and so those are the types of transformations that we talked about last time. One of the things that we didn't get to, and I wish kind of that we'd be able to at least get this one more <laughs> slide done last time, was about the order in which we do those kinds of transformations. So that's where we're going to pick up today is the order of transformations. All right, so if you have a transformation that has quite a few different um, trans. Uh, like transformations in it. Um, so like maybe some of these ones that we did last time, do you guys remember writing these down? They gave us a verbal description and we wrote an equation. If you were doing these particular transformations, the order in which you do them could potentially give you a different looking graph than if I did them in a different order. Now that's not true about every different flipper, you know, whatever you've got going on, but sometimes they could. So we do need to make sure that we're doing them in the order that is appropriate. So what is that order? Well, that order is to think about doing transformations much like we would do order of operations, which is to do things from the inside out. That was a movie, right? Yes, it was. Did anybody watch it? It was cute. Inside out. Okay, so what do I mean by inside out? Well, the inside would be inside the parenthesis and then moving outward from there, okay? So on the inside of the parenthesis, the way that this one is written is the minus h, right, with the, with the x. Write it as minus h, write it as plus h, it doesn't really matter, but it's the value that's associated with the plus or the minus of the x variable, okay? And that's a horizontal transformation a tr or translation. Um, so that moves things left and right. So in other words, we should move things left and right first if there is that kind of a transformation on our function. Reflections and stretches, those would occur next because if you're moving from the inside out, the next thing that you would encounter is the times a at the beginning. Okay, multiplication before addition. So the times a would occur before the plus k. Um, so what is the a? Well, if the a is negative, you're going to have some kind of reflection. Um, if there were a negative inside with the x, you'd also have a reflection there to potentially deal with before you dealt with the one on the outside. Um, the A could be a stretch or shrink, right? Either pull it up and make it taller and skinnier or squish it down and make it short and fatter. Um, so that would be the vertical stretch shrink. And then the last thing that you would do, number three, is your vertical translation. That is moving things up or down. Now, some of these don't really matter so much the order of operations. For example, if you didn't have number two, no reflections, no stretches, any of that going on, it really wouldn't matter whether you moved it left, right, up, or down first. Really wouldn't make a difference, okay? None of that's a big deal. But it's step number two that causes problems. So imagine if you shifted something up three units and then you reflected it over the x-axis, you reflected it down, or you reflected it down and then you shifted it up three units. The graph will look different. It would be in a different location on your xy plane. So that's why we need to make sure that we're doing it in the same order and the order that we go from is from the inside out. All right, there's one more piece of information in this section and this information is about symmetry. There are two special types of symmetry that we're going to encounter. One is called y-axis symmetry. These are also called even functions. The other one is called uh, origin symmetry, and these are called odd functions. Okay, so if it's y-axis symmetry or it's even symmetry, then this is basically a reflection over the y-axis. And what it actually says is that if you reflect over the y-axis, the graph doesn't change. That's what it would mean to have symmetry. And you've seen two graphs, at least, that do this all the time. This graph, what's the equation of that graph? Y equal what? X squared, right? it's a parabola, okay? And of course, very specifically, it's a parabola with the vertex at the origin and so forth, okay? Um, if I shifted this, uh, this parabola to the right or to the left, it wouldn't necessarily work, right? For example, if this parabola looked like 
this and I reflected it over the y-axis, the reflection would be like this. And it, and it wouldn't be the exact same place that it was before, right? So the location of where it's placed matters in whether or not it actually uh, has the symmetry we're talking about. I'm going to need this space later, so I'm going to delete this for now. Another function that you have seen that has this type of a symmetry looked like this. What was this graph a graph of? Yeah, absolute value of x. Um, and there are ways that we can manipulate these, right? Like if we shrink these and stretch these, we're still good, no problem. If we move them up and down, also still okay. Left and right, not going to be okay. So you can't just look at an equation and say, oh, look, it's got an x squared in it, therefore it is, you know, has y-axis symmetry. You can't do that, all right? You actually have to look at all the pieces of the equation, and we'll talk about that in a minute. The other type of symmetry is called origin symmetry, um, or it's an odd function. And what this means is that if we do a 180 degree rotation through the origin or around the origin, we have the same graph that we had before. And the most common one that you see referenced whenever you see this is this one right here. Don't examine my graphs too very closely because I'm not trying to be super precise. I'm just giving a sketch. What is this an equation of? Does anybody remember? X cubed. Good. This is y equal x cubed. And if you imagine like playing like a board game where you have a spinner and you sort of put the brad that spins it around in the center on the origin and you spun this 180 degrees, it would land right back down on top of itself. Can you picture doing that physically? Because that's what it means to have origin symmetry. Okay? There's another one that we saw um, back in section 2.1. Uh, it's a similar graph. It looked like this. Does anybody remember the equation of this graph? What is it? Very, yeah, it is. It's x equal y cubed or y equals cube root of x. Yeah, that's another way of expressing it. Same thing. Not quite as common. We don't see it used quite as frequently. We will in a minute here use this piece, um, but this is another one. So obviously one way to sort of think about this is from a graphing standpoint. That's what I just drew, right? Sort of think about what happens on the graph. Um, but sometimes it's really easy to look at a graph and think that it's got the reflection, but it's really not perfectly reflected, right? It's like looking at your hands, right? They're mirror images of each other more or less, right? But it's not perfect reflection. There's symmetry in your face, but it's not a perfect reflection, correct? So we want something that's a little bit more concrete than saying, it's pretty close. Pretty close doesn't always work in math, right? I don't want those NASA astronauts getting pretty close. It doesn't sound like a very good idea. So there's got to be a more concrete way of saying it really does work. And there is. There's an algebraic way that we're going to take a look at for deciding if a function is even or odd. So if a function is even, then we try to do this. We test what is f of negative x. In other words, if we replace all the x's in the equation with negative x and the function is even, it means that, that we will get the exact same function we started with. That's how we can know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that we have an even function. If we replace all of the x's with negative x, and the function does not change, then the function is even. And if you think about that from a graphing <coughs> standpoint, that makes sense. This x value of 1 gives me the same y value as this x value of negative 1 does. And we could do that for every single x value. The positive x value and the negative x value all give me the same y value as long as they match the positive and the negative value after it, the co or the constant value after it. All right, so that's what it means um, numerically or algebraically to be even. To be odd will mean that if I put in that negative x, testing the same exact thing, replace all the x's with negative x, this is actually going to change all the signs. I will get a negative f of x. And again, from a visual standpoint, we agree that this makes sense. If this x value right here gives me this y value, then the corresponding x value over here that's negative will give me the same y value but the negative of it, right? So like this x value that's 1 gives me a y value that's 1, but this x value that's negative 1 gives me a y value that's negative 1. Same value, just opposite signs, okay? 
So we can test whether something is even or odd actually by testing this one little piece, just that piece, f of negative x. So that's what we're going to test to decide if we have even or odd functions, and we're going to test three of them. And obviously if something is not even and it's not odd, then we've got a third category we call it neither. All right, so the question asks us, is the function even, odd, or neither? And we're going to test by plugging in negative x in the place of the x's. So everywhere I have an x, I'm going to put a parenthesis negative x. Okay? So right now it's just a replacement. Replace x with negative x. After that, I need to simplify what I've gotten. Because my goal is to compare that to what I originally had, the original function before I replaced anything. So what happens when we multiply negative x times negative x times negative x times negative x, the first piece? The negatives become positive because there's four of them, right? I've got four negatives, so that's a positive. And then I've multiplied x by itself four times, so that's x to the fourth. So this first piece is x to the fourth, and it's positive. Right? How about the second one? I've got a negative 2 here, but what is negative x quantity squared? It's just x squared. Again, two negatives make positive. So the negative 2 that's here stays negative 2 because negative x times negative x is x squared. Now I want you to compare that back to the original equation, and what do you notice? It's the same. This is equal to the original equation, f of x. So that means, very good, that it's even. If I get back what I originally started with, identically with my signs, that's usually the issue is the signs, but identically, then I've got an even function. All right, let's try part b. And could you confirm this by graphing it? Yeah, you should. In fact, I think go back to your calculator and make sure that that makes sense from the graph. If you do graph this one, just so that you're aware, it looks like a W. My graph's not perfect, but can you see that that seems like it should be symmetric with respect to the y-axis? Yeah, it, it's a reasonable assumption by looking at it, and we verified it with algebra. All right, let's try B. Now, if you wanted to start out the other direction and you wanted to say, well, I'm just going to check my calculator and sort of you know, give myself a, a clue as to what I think is going to end up happening, right? I'm going to guess. <laughs> you could probably graph this one without your calculator because we've already talked about how to graph this. This is the graph of x squared. Changed how? To the right. It's moved to the right one. We talked about that last time, right, Amos? So this is shifted to the right one, so visually it looks roughly like this. Does that look like it's an even function? If I flip it around the y-axis, do I have the exact same graph? Doesn't look like it. Does it look like it's odd? If I spin it around the origin, do I have the exact same graph? No. So my expectation by looking at this graph alone is that this is probably neither. And we're going to confirm that again with algebra. So how do we do that? Well, we test negative x in place of the x's. That's what we always test. It's always the same testing point. Replace x with negative x. So in place of my x here, I've got negative x minus my 1 squared. So it's, it's kind of hard looking at these two equations to compare them because they're in factored form. And it will probably be easier to compare them if I distribute them out. So that's my best suggestion at this point. I'm going to move this piece down, and we'll go back and work with the original one. If I were to simplify this one and I were to multiply it by itself, I would have to use distribution or foiling, right? What does this become if I simplify and distribute this out? x squared minus 2x plus 1. Is that okay with everybody? Okay, good. Second equation, do the same thing. I want to distribute it out. But I have negative x minus 1. Man, there's a lot of negatives in this one as well, so don't lose them. Negative x minus 1. I still have negative x times negative x becoming positive x squared. What happens when I do the inner and the outer terms here, though? I get a positive, yeah, 2x, don't I? 
because I have a negative times a negative here. Let me use yellow. Negative times a negative here and a negative times a negative here. So this actually gives me a positive 2x. And then what do I get at the end? Plus my 1. <coughs> so now we're going to compare these two. That is this one with this one. And the values are all the same, right? I have an x squared, I have a 2x, and I have a 1. It's the signs that are my concern. We either need the signs to all match, and that makes it even, or all of the signs to be backwards of each other, and that makes it odd. Okay? Well, what do you notice here? Neither are happening, right? The signs on the x squareds match, the signs on the plus 1s matches, but the signs on the 2x in the middle are opposite. Okay, so I don't have consistency here. I don't have all of them the same or all of them different. And because that's the case, this function would be neither, which is what we expected based on what we were looking at graphically anyway, right? That doesn't surprise us. Now, when you're doing this on a homework problem or a quiz problem, or if you're doing this on a test, what am I going to expect to see? Well, I'm going to expect to see the algebra. Okay, so make sure you're showing me the algebra to verify yes, it works, or no, it doesn't. Yes, it's even, no, it's not, or whatever, okay? Last example, we're testing, again, just like on all of them, negative, in place of, negative x in place of the x. So everywhere I have an x, I'm going to put in a parenthesis and a negative x. Okay. So let's talk about negative x cubed. What's happening when I multiply negative x times negative x times negative x? Do I get a positive or a negative? I get a negative. And I get the same x cubed that I originally had in my original problem. All right, the cube root's kind of funny. You know that you don't take cube roots of negatives, I'm sorry, square roots of negatives. But cube roots of negatives, are they okay? They are. Let's give a quick example. If I had the cube root of negative 8, what answer would I get? Negative 2, not 2i. i's come about from square roots. But it's negative 2 because negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2, three negatives, gives me the negative 8 that's underneath the radical, in this case a cube root radical. Now compare that to this. The negative's out in front, right? What's the cube root of 8? 2. So what does this tell you about the negative either the outside or underneath a cube root? It's the same. So if there's a negative underneath the root of the radical, a cube root radical, I could pull it to the outside of the radical and it wouldn't change the value, correct? So, in this expression, I can rewrite this with a negative in front of the radical compared to the cube root of x that was already there. Now, again, the goal is to compare the original function with the one that I just got. And what do you notice? It's odd. Why is it odd? All the signs are opposite, correct? Correct. Now, it's important to notice it's not because the positives all became negative. It's because they all changed. If the original function I started with had some negatives in it and then they became positive, that would also count, right? Because the point is that they're changing. Whatever they were, they're different now. So this one is, in fact, odd. <laughs>